do with, with this project. Uh, given the fact that we had teacher level value added data in about 40 districts in the state of Ohio, what seemed to be a, a kind of a no-brainer was to say, let's identify those people who year in, year out, rise to the top in terms of their gains. And let's bring them together and ask them, what are you doing that really makes a difference? It's important to know that when we did this research, the, uh, we looked only at value added. We did not ask for recommendations from principals or anything else. We looked at people whose value added scores over time, over multiple years, were at least three standard errors above expected. They also had to show positive gains with all their student subgroups. So we, we uh, at least in this first round, we wanted people who were very successful in growing their low achievers, their middle achievers, and their high achievers. So in order to get at some important stuff, we had to get them in conversation with each other. And so we used an appreciative inquiry process. Some of you may use that. It's a wonderful uh, kind of organization and development tool. But we really used it to kind of get at what it is that these people are doing. So what we did was we had these teachers interview each other and spent uh, uh, an hour, two people interviewing each other in terms of what they did in their practice, those things that were the kind of highlights for them. Groups, we asked them to begin to identify what are the things that you're hearing over and over again? What are the things that you're hearing that are common? as you talk about teachers. And I'll tell you, one of the things that's not common is all these people teach very differently. Some of them are very traditional. Some of them are very progressive. Some of them are both traditional and progressive in terms of how they do their instruction. So the, the secret is not out there in terms of how they teach. The first thing they talked about was that for these people, it's very important that they are productive. And when they say productive, what they mean is every single kid, every single day. The unit of analysis for these folks is not their classroom, it is the individual kid. The third one is this, this uh, uh, they are absolutely student-centered. Relationships are key to them. And especially with teachers in urban areas, one of the things that we hear over and over again is, until my kids know I care about them as a human being, they're not going to do anything for me. And so relationships and building powerful, strong relationships <coughs> with kids is absolutely essential for their work. The fourth thing we heard was that there, there is this element of change and growth, and they talk about their classroom not being the same at the end of the year as it is the beginning of the year, that there's this sense of change that's constantly going on, that their kids are part of that, that uh, these teachers don't necessarily dictate everything that's going to happen, that their kids become part of that process. So this whole notion of, of change and adaptability are really uh, essential to them. So, so that they're constantly reinventing themselves, they're constantly reinventing their classrooms. These are the kind of people who will walk into class with a lesson plan and in five minutes figure, this isn't working today with this group of kids, I'm going to do something different. in the 80s when I, was, uh, when I was doing my program at Ohio State, uh, there was a guy by the name of Robert Quinn whose, whose, quest, whose primary question was, what is it that makes an organization effective? And so he was studying organizational effectiveness, and what came out of his work was what he called a competing values framework. And so for Quinn, the, uh, all of those things that you see really good organizations do ended up lining up around two different kind of axes. One of them is the one that's up there now. That is flexibility and openness on one end, structure and control on the other. And essentially what he was saying is really effective organizations are both interested in structure and control as well as flexibility and openness. The other thing that was apparent, uh, and, and again, when you take those same things that come out of highly effective organizations, is that they look both internally and externally. The external is all about, are the things that we're doing in our organization 
Is there a fit in the external world? Do we provide a role in the world? That's important. Internally, it's all about how does our, uh, how does our place of business work? Do people know who to talk to? Do they know how to get things done? And so uh, an organization that's effective is both external fo externally focused and internally focused at the same time. And Quinn saw kind of four different models of what it means to be an effective organization here. The bottom right is all about productivity, efficiency, planning. Bottom left uh, is all about stability, control, management. Top left is human relations, cohesion, morale, all those things that matter. The top right is adaptability, readiness, getting resources, etc. Those four things that we heard from teachers map exactly onto Quinn's framework. So the things that teachers were talking about in terms of an effective classroom were exactly the th same things that Quinn talked about when he was talking about an effective organization. So what's interesting is to think of teachers as CEOs of complex organizations. And if you've ever been a teacher, and all of you in here have been, you know that teaching, working with kids, helping kids to learn is one of the most complicated things that any human being could do. Well, what we found with the highly effective teachers that was really interesting is that they were able to kind of deal with these opposite things in really uh, inventive ways. So, for example, they could be very productive and very child-centered at the same time. They could, they could really kind of push their kids hard, and what they said was, the reason I can push my kids hard is because they know I care about them a lot. And what we hear from highly effective teachers is that they are masters at creating really good structures, but structures that are open to change. And so structure and creativity work well together instead of working against each other. The really important stuff that came out of Quinn's work. <coughs> Every one of these values is a positive. But when one of these values begins to dominate your classroom, your classroom goes in the other direction. It goes negative. So that imagine a school district or a school where everything is on test scores. Push, push, push. All I care about is test scores. I don't care about anything else. What will tend to happen, and that would be in the bottom right-hand corner over here around productivity, one of the things that happens is that you, you, you become an oppressive sweatshop. And one of the first indications that you've become an oppressive sweatshop is that the relationships go to pop. Teachers don't talk to teachers. Uh, there's almost no collaboration going on. But you see that any one of these values taken to the extreme, taken to the extreme becomes a negative value. Uh, most HETs reported that when we brought them together, it's the first time anybody ever told them they were a really good teacher. And one of the things I'll tell you is that absolute easiest thing a principal can do to get the most out of their best teachers is to go up at the end of the school day, put your arm around them and say, you are a fabulous teacher and I've got the data to prove. Recognizing people for being really good is really important, but at the same time, what these teachers don't want is public recognition. They don't want you to stand up in a faculty meeting and say, hey, I want to tell you we have a, we have a highly effective teacher in the building, and it's over, it's over here. They don't want that. Most of them also told us that they had very little familiar, familiarity with their value-added data. That has since changed. The other thing we heard, one-size-fits-all PD is a waste of time. And so what, what we have got to begin to do with teachers is to differentiate in the same way we talk about with kids. That everybody has particular strengths in particular areas in which they need to improve, and we've got to start fitting professional development to what those things are. What does this mean for all of us, I think? Um, first of all, there absolutely are real differences in effectiveness of classroom teachers. And as a profession, we've got to recognize that and say, what are we going to do with that knowledge? How are we going to deal with the fact 
that not everybody in the building is a superstar in, in this way or in this way. We've got to start saying, how are we going to, how are we going to use that? How are we going to leverage the fact that we know that instead of ignoring that? Highly effective teachers talk about their work in surprisingly consistent ways. This was a really big surprise to me. And again, the consistency is not in terms of how I teach reading or how I teach math. It's consistency in terms of those four categories that we talked about. Effective teachers really think about their classrooms in very complex ways. And so teaching, really, especially really good teaching, is really complicated. Now, there is not a lot in the structure of schools that allows people to productively get together and have those collaborative conversations that we need to have. And so creating those cultures that support people getting together in meaningful ways, I think, is, is really important.